Welcome to the second chunk of the Next Low Advanced Training, September 2023 edition. In this first chapter, we're going to be talking about groovy imports um, and pulling in sort of helpful classes from the groovy and JVM ecosystem to help you accomplish some sort of uh, small tasks and uh, helpful bits and pieces inside of your Next Low workflow. Fantastic. Let's get started. Welcome. All right, let's get started talking groovy imports. Um, and JSON parsing. As with all the other chapters, we're going to CD into the chapter directory, and this one is called advanced slash groovy. Let's have a look around with tree. We see that there's a main.nf um, and a modules directory. And inside the modules directory, we under modules local fastp, we have a main.nf, um, which is a fastp module. Let's have a look at the top level main.nf. We're including that module here on line one. And then we have a very simple little workflow um, where we define a parameter input by default. Uh, then we use channel from path and use parameter input. We split it into CSV and view the output. Note here that this is not a file on my local file system. This is being pulled in via remote. Of course, Nextflow speaks uh, a lot of different protocols, HTTPS, S3, Azure, GCP, Blob Storage, FTP, all of those sort of fun protocols. Uh, what is this main.nf inside of modules? So here we have um, a really simple little fastp module. Um, it defines a container to run in, uh, expects to be given an input of a meta object and a read. Um, there might be a list or a single uh, path. And it defines two output processes, rather two output channels, a, um, a reads channel and a JSON channel. Great, let's just run the workflow as it exists now. Just to make sure that this uh, CSV can be pulled in and passed correctly. Great, we have our maps. So we have our rows, which are passed as metamaps, meta or rather just groovy maps. So let's write a small closure here to pass each of these rows into our familiar form of a metamap and then maybe a list of paths. So we're going to take a row and we're going to say meta equals row dot sub map. This is what we learned earlier. Let's just double check that, that works. Do we have the sample and stratonous keys? Right. Ah, oh, the stratonous is not correct. Let's just double check. It's probably, I've just misspelled strandedness. Okay, great. So we have this meta object. Fantastic, two keys. Um, the trick here is that we've precluded the possibility of adding additional columns. So here we're specifying exactly the columns that we want. But let's say we wanted to make our workflow a little bit more flexible um, in that we wanted to accommodate the ability to add extra columns in this CSV um, and uh, pass them through the workflow without modification. Here we're being very prescriptive and we're only gonna pass through these two uh, keys. So what we would like to do is read this row object find all of the keys, subtract the keys that we don't want and retain everything else. So um, we want to subtract the keys we don't want and those keys that we don't want uh, to retain are those far, one at the beginning with fastq, so fastq1 and fastq2. So let's grab all of the keys. We can do this with the row dot uh, key set method. Just show you what that looks like. It's the key set for each row is this example: fastq1, fastq2, standardness. But if we add the split method, that will split this key set into two sets: some that pass this test, so 
we're going to find all the key sets that match this regular expression. So that begin with fast Q, that'll be these two keys. And then a different set of those keys that do not pass this uh, Boolean test. That is, they don't start with fast Q, that is sample one and strandedness. I'll show you what that looks like if we just remove the destructuring. See exactly here. So for each element, we have a list containing the keys that match our test and the keys that match that don't match the test. So the meta keys, what we're calling the meta keys, and then uh, a list that we can call the read keys. So I've supplied here links to the key set method if you're interested in the JVM documentation. And we're also using the split method, which I described, which divides a collection based on some closure returning a Boolean. From here, we're going to generate the reads. So here, we're going to use this read keys, which is a list of keys, and we're going to put that into the submap to specify uh, which keys we want. And we're going to collect over the values and return a file object. So now our reads contains a list of those file objects, those path objects. So that's ready to pass. Now we just need, or oh, actually let's test it because I think this will actually return an error. Uh, unfortunately, it does return an error. It says argument of file cannot be empty. So if we have a closer look at this sample sheet, we'll notice that not all rows contain two FASTQ files. Some of them just contain one FASTQ file. So for example, this row here, contains only one FASTQ file and the FASTQ2 column is left empty, which means that we are being passed and we're passing a null value into this file method, which, which doesn't work. So we need a way of accommodating that. So now, so we, here we're gonna take the submap of uh, the read keys and the values. What we're going to do is we're going to add one extra method in this chain. We're going to use find all, which is like a filter. We're going to find all those elements where it does not equal the empty string and then return those. So we're basically excluding elements where uh, that element in the row is the empty string. We're collecting those again with the file, file method. which now works, fantastic. Now our reads in these lists, if there are two reads, we are passing two. And if there's only one read, we're just passing a list of one, one read, which is perfect. Now what we need to do is construct the meta map. So we've got our reads objects. So we have this meta keys value, which is a list of keys that don't match FASTQ. So these are all the keys we want to pass into the meta map. Um, if we look at, if we remind ourselves of what we're trying to shoot for here, we're going to construct a channel that has elements that match this pattern. So a meta object and then path reads. I can see here, if we look at inside here, this module requires or expects two extra keys, this ID key, and a single end key. And we want to be able to pass those through. We want to make a channel that can be passed directly into this fast key process, fast key process. So let's get cracking. Simple start would be taking the sub route of the meta keys. So if we see what that looks like. Again, remember that this closure is returning the last of the last sort of expression, which in this case is the meta object. Okay, great. So we have our meta objects that contain the key sample and strandedness. And if we were to add an extra column in there, they would appear here uh, inside of our meta maps. 
we want to add those two extra features. We want to add two extra keys. We want to add this single end key and an ID key. Here I'm introducing another little piece of handy groovy syntax, this question mark equal operators. What this is, is the same as saying meta.id equals meta.id question mark. Meta.id. Yeah. So this is saying if meta.id exists, then use meta.id. Otherwise, use meta.sample. This is what we call a ternary operator. Um, so if meta.id exists, so for example, if there is a column inside of our sam sample sheet with um, header ID, then we're going to use that um, as the meta ID, which is basically going to leave it unchanged. Um, or rather, if it's yeah, if it's null. Um, otherwise, we're going to use uh, the meta.sample. Uh, we're going to use the same value for sample as ID. And that leaves us one more key to do. We want to have this single end key. So it's going to equal, we're going to have a look at this reads object. Remember here earlier that if the reads object uh, contains two keys, that means we have paired end reads, or rather if it contains two elements, we have paired end reads. Um, and if it has one object, we have single end reads. So. I think that should just not do us. And we're just piping into view before we pipe into fast speed, just to double check that everything looks okay. Great, strandedness auto, single end false. Single end false. Single end true, perfect. So for those samples where we only have one fastq file, single end has been set to true. Great. So now we have this channel that matches the cardinality of the input channel to our FastP process. We can now pipe this into FastP. Um, I'm going to make one more modification. We're going to say docker dot enabled equals true. So this way we can use this container definition in the fast P process. Oops. Of course, the fast P process has two outputs, so we can't view all of them. That's going to take a minute or so to run. Note here that I'm always using the desk resume flag to pick up cache results wherever possible. This is going to be important, particularly now. So I can run next to run resume and it should be able to pick up the cache results and I don't need to do any extra calculations. Perfect. Seven cache tasks. All right, let's have a look at these outputs. So we have our meta map, fantastic. And then we have these fast P JSON objects. Let's have a look at one of them. So there's probably some really, there's definitely some really interesting information here that we might want to pull out and supply to downstream processes. Maybe we want to pull pieces of that out um, and include them in our metadata objects. Um, but we don't necessarily want to write a, a JSON parser ourselves. Um, we suspect there's probably a JSON parser available inside of Groovy or inside of the JDM. Uh, so let's try and use existing code rather than writing our own. Uh, before we get actually into the JSON parsing, let's uh, cover publishing, publishing files. Um, to make our lives a little bit convenient, let's actually 
add um, a publish the directive to the FASTP process. We made a small modification to the Nextflow config earlier to add Docker. Let's add one more. You know, inside the process directive, inside the process block, we can use the with name selector to add a process directive to just those processes that match this name, FASTP, which is, of course, the name of our FASTP process. We're going to add this publish the directive. We're going to add a path uh, key. So we're going to say um, publish all of the outputs from this process to a directory name results slash FASTP slash JSON. And we're going to also use the save as directory. Oh, sorry, the save as argument to publish here. So this save as argument requires you to supply a closure. This closure takes is uh, iterated over every element that's published or rather every output from the process. It receives the file name of the output and then it returns the file, that you, the, rather the name that you'd like to publish that file under. So if you'd like to rename a file, um, that's how you can do it with the save as block. So here we're taking file name and we're asking, does it end with .json? And if it does, we're going to reuse the file name. And if it doesn't, we're going to say null. So basically we're using the save as block as a filter. So we're only publishing the JSON files to uh, this results slash fastp slash JSON directory. Let's try that. Oops. Just going to pause there for people to catch up. Fantastic. You can see here now, here now in our results directory slash fast page slash JSON, we have sim links into each of our JSON files. This is going to enable us to quickly test the JSON passing without having to write uh, waiting on fast peak caching. Uh, so let's consider the possibility we'd like to, yeah, we know, we know that there are some interesting things inside of these JSON files that we'd like to capture uh, and use, use downstream. There's a link here to the Groovy documentation, um, specifically the Groovy documentation around JSON passing. And it notes that we need to import this JSON slipper class. So I can do that inside of my main.nf, just have this import groovy.json.json slipper. Um, and I'm going to introduce the idea of an, and a second endpoint now. These endpoints allow us to have different workflows within the same main.nf. This can be very handy for uh, testing. Oops, fast B, JSON, star JSON. And I'm going to view those just to make sure I have capturing them at all. And to run this second workflow, note here that it's got a name. I will run nextflow run dash resume entry JSON test. So after the dash entry argument, I'm supplying the name of the workflow I'd like to run. Perfect. So I'm returning a channel with each of our JSON objects in here. Let's create a small function at the top of our uh, main.nf that is going to take, be responsible for passing our JSON. So it's a little function. Uh, we're going to call it get filter result. It's going to take a JSON file. And here we're constructing a new JSON slurper object. Um, we're going to call the pass text and we're going to call JSON file dot text. So this dot text method is a really handy little groovy feature for reading a file and returning a string of all the text. That'll return the fastp result. So I'm going to pause here for a small exercise. Given this um, fastp result turned from fastp method is a large map. Um, I want you to have a go at modifying this get filtering result uh, to return just 
the after filtering section of the report. So if we look at one of these files, you can see here there's a small section called after filtering. Um, so how would you modify that function to return just this after filtering section? I'm going to give everyone about five minutes to attempt that. There's a solution here, but try and give it your, go yourself before uh, checking the solution. I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, great. Welcome back. I hope you had a go at that small exercise. And here's, there's obviously uh, a number of different ways in which you might uh, attempt this, but here is one potential solution. So let's double check and I'm going to write a little map method. So we can check our results. So at the moment, I'm returning this whole fast P result. So it's going to return whole fast P object passed into a big map. It's going to be quite verbose, but let's just see what happens. So I'm not doing any filtering here. Yep. So I'm getting the whole JSON object returned here as a, a groovy map. So that's a little bit verbose and a little bit too much information. So let's have a close look at this map. So there's a summary key, and then inside of summary, we have after filtering. So if we wanted just a summary, we could do fast p result dot summary. And that returns a smaller object. Okay, so that's not quite as verbose. So we're getting there. The next thing we want is inside of summary, we want the after filtering block. And we can just use dot notation inside of Groovy to step inside each of these elements. And here we have just the after filtering results. And that's what we want. So we have some information like the total number of reads, the total number of bases, the total number of Q20 bases, all that sort of stuff. So let's say we wanted to use that to pass into our MetaMap object. This is pretty close. This is good, but it's slightly dangerous. We're assuming here that uh, the summary object will always exist and the after filtering object will always exist. We're going to run into problems if the FastP um, code changes and they rearrange that JSON object because if the summary object moves or is renamed, we're going to be calling a dot after filtering method on null, which is going to cause an error. Fortunately for us, there's a safe access option. Instead of dot, we can use question mark dot, which means that if this summary is null, then the question, this will not be called and it will just return early a null object, the null object. Um, but if it does exist, then we'll call after filtering um, on that non-null object. And the last thing we can do is we don't need to assign this to a name. We can just call New JSON server dot past it summary dot after filtering. Fantastic. Great. So we're returning, uh, we're passing each of these JSON files through our get filtering results method, and we're returning this nice uh, map with all of the statistics from uh, FastB. Now we can use uh, this to join back to our original map. So instead of, we're taking the JSON from the FastP, we're gonna map it into meta and JSON. And so now we're, going back to editing the main workflow, the unnamed workflow. So I can drop my entry. Great. So now we've taken the JSON channel, the output channel from FastP, and turned it into a channel that has the meta map, then the uh, map of um, extra metadata that we've pulled out from FastP. Uh, so, but now we have two channels. We have this channel returned from here, and then we also have the FastP.out.read channel. At some point, we're going to want to join those back together. And we can use the join method here, which is a new method we've not talked about, a rather new operator we've not talked about yet, which is sort of like group tuple, but for joining two different channels on a common key. Whereas the group tuple is for joining elements within a single channel, sharing a key. The join method allows us to join elements from two channels that share a key. 
So I'm going to pipe that into join and because I know that the fastp.out.reads also has the metadata object. If we look at the fastp object, I can see here that the reads passes the metadata object through unchained, unchanged. So because we're also passing the metadata object through unchanged, we'll be able to join on that key. Fantastic. Great. So here we have our elements from the channel. We have a metadata object. Then we have another map describing the fast P metadata. And then the fast Q.gz. So the reads from fast P. So these are the filtered sort of trimmed reads from fast P joined back with the uh, metadata from the fast P passed into a more convenient form. So there's uh, one last exercise here before we end this chapter. Can you amend this pipeline to create two channels that filter the reads to exclude any samples where the Q30, Q30 rate rather is less than 93.5? So we want to have two channels. Um, so we have one channel that, of reads that pass the filter and another channel of reads that don't pass the filter, that fail the part, that the fail the filtering test. We're going to use probably the branch operator that we introduced earlier in the workshop. Um, but I'll give you uh, five or so minutes to uh, attempt this exercise. We'll see you soon. Great. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. Here's one potential solution. There are a couple of different ways of doing this, but I think this is a neat one. So we have our, um, we've joined um, our fast P reads with our metadata. And we, re we have this new channel uh, that has metadata, fast P metadata and reads. What we can do is join, it's sort of unnecessary to have these two metadata objects, metadata from the sample sheet and then metadata from fastp. We can join those together. So let's map this. So we have meta, fastp, um, meta, and then the reads. Um, and I'm just gonna join those together with the plus operator. Great. So now we only have one metadata object containing all of the pieces of metadata from those two maps. Great. So one big metadata object and then the reads. Now we need to do the branching operation. We can use the branch operator to produce two output channels a pass channel for those samples whose metadata where the Q30 rate passes some threshold and a fail channel for those samples whose reads do not pass the threshold. We need the branch operator that we talked about earlier in the workshop. I'm gonna pass names to this closure. Use my stabby operator. And again, remember from the branch operator, we give it a name of an output channel and then some expression that returns a Boolean value. Because I already have the meta metadata from fastp in the metadata object, we can just access it here, pull out the key, Q30 base. We're gonna say, does it equal or is it greater than 0 0.935? And fail, true. So for, I'm going to use this true fall through so that if the element or if the sample does not pass this test, then it will automatically go into the fail output channel. And we're going to call that reads. Let's see if there are any reads that fail.
No, there are no reads that fail QC, which is great news. Are there any reads that pass QC? Fantastic. So we have all of our reads that passed QC. If we wanted to pull out all of the, uh, uh, the values, the QC30 values of the reads that pass, we can do it with views.pass. You know, this is a metadata and then reads. Metadata, QC30 basis. Pass QC with reads Q30 basis equals. Uh, whoops. Uh, I didn't mean Q30 basis, I meant Q30 rate. Uh, excellent. And now that uh, I've corrected my typo, I can see here that we have two reads, uh, two samples that failed the QC that had a Q30 rate of less than 0 0.935. So now we could take these two output channels, reads.fail and reads.pass, and pass them through different uh, routes through our graph. This is one of the great strengths of Nextflow in that you can dynamically calculate uh, the trajectory of any particular data set through the graph, depending on the results from the previous tasks. So you can sort of divert data through the graph, um, depending on results like this uh, fast P quality control test. You might dump the failed results into a data directory and perhaps even warn the user, indicating that there were some reads that did not pass uh, Q30 or QC results, and then have this reads.pass channel that diverts the rest of the data, the good data, through the rest of the, um, the pipeline. All right. I hope that's helpful. Uh, we'll move on to the next chapter. Inside of Nextflow workflow uh, repository, there are a couple of special directories which are treated differently to, to other directories. Uh, they are the bin directory, the lib directory, and the templates directory. Uh, particularly the bin directory is extremely useful for a lot of Nextflow workflows and heavily used in the NF core community. I'm just going to go over um, some of the details about each um, and show how they might be used. Let's get started. Okay. So inside of an Excel work directory, there are a couple of directories that are treated uh, specially, uh, treated differently to the other directories, uh, bin directory, lib directory, and templates directory. Let's start with the bin directory because it's the most important um, and it's the most useful uh, for most Nextflow workflows. Let's CD into advanced slash structure and have a look around. So I have a little main.nf um which isn't important at the moment but let's say um that i have some small accessory scripts that i'd like to distribute with my workflow those scripts might be a little python script a, a bash script a r script um any sort of interpreted language a single script um, small file that needs to travel along with the workflow. Perhaps it's being used inside of some of your processes to do some data cleanup or some data munging. Um, it's not an uncommon task to need these sort of small accessory scripts. And there are a couple of different ways in which you might supply those scripts uh, and make them available to in, inside of Nextflow tasks. The first is to bundle them with your Docker containers. So they could be versioned inside the Docker containers um, but for small scripts that might need to be updated sort of semi-regularly, it's a little bit of a pain to have to check them into version control, rebuild your Docker container, upload your Docker container to your repository, and then test your workflow. Um, fortunately, Nextflow has a way to bundle those accessory scripts with the workflow inside of version control. 
so that the workflow and the scripts that he and the processes and tasks using that rather so the script and the processes and tasks using that script are all move in lockstep under the same revision control system so let's give uh, let's do an example um, let's say I have a small R script and it does some work. The work that the R script is doing is not uh, particularly important. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a bin directory inside of the root of my uh, Nextflow workflow. And inside of bin, I'm going to make a, an R script called cars.r. Um, and it's a dumb little R script, um, which just loads tidyverse, um, produces a plot, saves a PNG and a, a TSV. So it's it writes two files, a PNG and a TSV. Um, specifics are not important. This just loads as the MPG data set that's bundled inside of uh, inside of Tidyverse. And let's say we uh, would like to make a script which uses, or rather, a process which uses this script. Um, I'm going to make a little process called plot cars. I'm going to use a particular, oops, a particular container that has tidyverse installed. Um, and this script doesn't have any need any input, but it does have output. I'm going to say it's going to produce one or more PNGs. Um, I'm going to emit them in an output channel called plot. And the same for uh, TSV, and I'm going to say it's going to be emit uh, in an output channel called table. And this script just uh, echoes cars, actually runs cars. Let's say it could be slightly more complicated. Perhaps you can say echo. Note here that I'm not worried about where that car.r script is located. I'm just calling it as if it was in the path. And this will work both for my local file system when I'm running Nextflow on my laptop, but also if I'm running at scale in the cloud, I don't have to care about uh, where that R script is located in exactly the same way that inside of my processes, I don't care about where the input data comes from. I don't need to worry about the path of the input data. Nextflow takes care of all of that for me. And in the same way, it takes care of adding the bin directory to the path. So I can just call cars.r. So one very important thing that I've, I've not done yet is made this cars.r executable. At the moment, you can see here, if I run ls-lh bin, I can see my cars.r, but it's not executable. So Nextflow will take care of moving that bin directory and supplying it to the virtual machines or the tasks, but it, and then adding that directory to the path. But I still need to take responsibility and make those scripts executable. So I'm going to do that with chmod plus x bin cars.r. And now they're executable so that when Nextflow adds the bin directory to the path, it's going to, I mean, I can just call cars R. Let's run this script and see what happens. Last thing I want to do is um, modify Nextflow config to use Docker. In the current directory, I'm going to create a nextflow.config file. Oops. I could put it in a profile, but I could, um, yeah, actually, let's put it in a profile. So here I'm uh, creating a new profile called Docker and setting the docker.enable true uh, variable inside of that Docker uh, profile. So now I can run next flow, run current directory, profile Docker.
So what Maxwell is going to do now, it's going to ensure that the uh, Docker slash Tidyverse latest container is available locally. Um, and it's going to run that process. It'll just take a minute or so for that to download. While that's happening, um, I want to make a, an important note about the shebang line here. I've used here hashbang user bin n r script. This is really important for portability. So on my laptop, I might have R script already installed in a particular location. In fact, um, I do, it's in like homebrew slash bin slash R script. But of course, if I wanted to make my workflow as portable as possible, I'd like to make it available, uh, ensure that I can run it on the cloud. And when I'm running in the, in the cloud, I might not be running inside, like I might be running this uh, R script locally or I might be running inside of Docker. And if I'm running inside of a Docker container, the R script location, the location of this binary uh, executable might be in a different location. Uh, so if I were to hard code the path here, user bin, maybe. So one option would be to hard code the path here. For example, if I know in, in this particular container that R script is located in this location, uh, that would work for that particular container. But if someone else wanted to use my workflow and maybe update the container, use a slightly different version of Tidyverse, um, and if that container had the R script executable at a different location, this shebang line is going to fail. That's why it's particularly important to use a portable shebang line, ideally using user bin n. So that will go the same if you're using R script or if you're using a Python executable, or whatever your interpreter is, make it as portable as possible um, because this script may be executed in a different context in a container or different containers or locally or inside a quarantine environment. I can see here that my next load task is finished. Um, my podcast process is done. So let's just double check that it actually ran. By viewing the output uh, and viewing the PNG output channel. Oops, full plot. Fantastic. And same for the table. Great. I can see this. So what I've demonstrated here is the ability to use a small accessory script that I would check into version control that would move in lockstep with my uh, next low workflow versions. Um, and I can just call as if it was already in the path in all potential contexts and next will take care of making sure that's true. So let's have a little look behind the scenes and see what next is actually doing here. So it was this process, 46 slash 5C. So I'm going to CD into that directory. Oops. I'm going to open it up in VS Code. And so this is just that single task working directory. You'll remember that Nextflow executes all tasks in their own individual uh, work directory that's keyed by the hashes of their inputs. And I can see here the .command.run file. So this is a file that Nextflow writes that takes care of setting up all the data, modifying the path, making sure all of the input data is available. And it's worth sort of occasionally looking through this command.run to see what's happening behind the scenes. Inside of this command.run, we have um, a couple of important uh, bash functions, one of which is this nxf container env. And so here we're exporting the path to be the, the existing path slash workspace git pod. So here is I'm adding that bin directory 
to the path. This works on the local machine. If I was operating on the cloud, this NXF container and function would be slightly different. It would be copying in, first copying in the directory to make it available on the virtual machine and then adding the path. Inside of this command.run, you also have uh, staging in, staging out, uh, rather staging in of input data with ln-s if it's on a local file system or a shared file system or copying it in um, via cloud command lines if you're operating in cloud. Again, here is a warning just to be sure about using a portable shebang line in your bin scripts. The second important directory that's treated uh, in a particular way by Nextflow is the templates directory inside of the root of your Nextflow workflow repository. You might have situations where the script block is becoming quite long. So if your script block here, you might have a long bash script or perhaps you have started a small Python script um, and you're using Perhaps you have some small, or rather increasingly large Python scripts in here. It starts small, but it sort of grows over time and you feel that this grows beyond a few dozen lines and it starts to dominate the main.nf um, of your workflow. You can use the templates directory to spin out that script into its separate file um, uh, and move it to a template file. I'll show you what that looks like. So instead of our plot cards function, I'm going to make a new process called say hi. I'm going to use the debug directive that we talked about last time uh, for echoing out the standard output from each of the tasks to the next low standard output. I'm going to make a process that takes expects a channel that's going to supply a name and And I'm going to use a template adder.py. So instead of writing a string here, I'm going to call this template method or function and supply the path to a template. You can see here in templates, I have this adder.py. So this is a, a very dumb little uh, Python script. But you'll know it's not quite Python because I'm using dollar sign string interpolation here. So this is next low native string interpolation. So here, this is not just pure Python. This is as if I had written this in a script block. So instead of writing this in a script block like this, and let's say I had many lines here, it was becoming overwhelming. Uh, let's just see what it looks like. I'm running it in a script block actually, just to just to show you that it works. So we have each of these names. Oops, small typo on my part. Uh, require a closing braces. Great. So now we have hello, hello, hello. Each of these are odd dog names. Um, but let's say instead of having this in a script block, I'd like to use the templates function. So instead of this script block, I have this adder.py, which is under templates. And now I can just simply write template adder.py.
Perfect. And so you can see here that we have the same results. We have hello for each of these names because this added.py template has been pulled out and added in place of my uh, script block. The last uh, special directory that we'd like to talk about is the lib directory. And this is <clears throat> slightly more complicated. You might remember in the last chapter, we talked about adding a uh, small helper function to the main.nf. We had that JSON parsing function. And certainly for small functions like that JSON parser, it's totally fine and totally reasonable to add them to the main.nf. But sometimes it, those sort of functions grow in complexity and it would be helpful to sort of bundle them into their own Groovy class. Um, and you can add Groovy classes uh, into the lib directory uh, and make them use available for use inside of your workflow, both inside of main.nf and any imported modules. Um, the number of the reasons why you might want to use this are many and varied. Um, for example, in the NF Core RNA Seq workflow, we have at least five different Groovy classes that are defined inside of the lib directory for doing all sorts of utility and uh, sort of miscellaneous accessory tasks. Um, lit, I've provided the link here to the NF Core RNA Seq workflow, and it's worth having just a quick look through uh, the example classes uh, the NF Core template uses. Um, most of the ones in the NF core are simply provided to execute early in the workflow and provide utility functions like helping uh, past uh, parameters, help texts, um, fancy formatting, and all of that sort of stuff. But the lib directory can also be used to provide functionally, functionality inside of the workflow itself. So let's give an example of that. Let's make a metadata class. And so this is just an example problem um, in almost all cases i'd probably recommend you use a simple map for passing metadata in almost all cases that's sufficient um, but i just want to use this as an example to show how you might add a class to your next load workflow so inside of lib uh, let's make a new file called metadata groovy and inside of metadata.groovy, we're going to make a new class. Classes in Groovy uh, begin with this class keyword, the name of the class. Um, and you can, because it's JVM and object oriented, you can extend the existing classes. So I'm going to make a class that extends the hash map. Um, and I'm going to add a simple new me uh, method called hi, which just returns a new string uh, called hello workshop participants. So it, you can think of it just like a normal map, just like the meta maps that we've been using, but it has one extra method called high. So we can use this in our, um, our workflow. I'm gonna clean this up. We can get rid of our R script example. I'm in Montreal at the moment. So I'm gonna make a new channel containing the city name. Um, we're not going to use it at the moment, but I'm going to use the new keyword to construct a new instance of our metadata class. And I'm going to say it the high. So I'm going to call the high method on that metadata class. Let's see what that looks like when I run the workflow. Remember that high method returns a string saying, hello, workshop participants. Great. So that's what we see here. So we've made a new class called metadata. We've popped it in a file called metadata.groovy inside the lib directory. And because uh, Nextflow ensures that any classes define inside the lib directory, rather, it ensures that this lib directory is added to the class path. It means that I can just simply call new metadata anywhere inside of my workflow and get a new instance of that object. Um, at the moment, we're just sort of we're making a channel that contains this city name, but it's not actually doing anything with it. So let's modify our metadata.groovy class, uh, our metadata class to take a name. 
um, we can have a constructor. So now we're going to have a constructor that takes a location or takes a string that we're going to call location and sets this sort of instance variable location. So now this location is going to be available inside of any of our methods. So now I, instead of returning a simple hello workshop participant, participant string, let's customize this message by location. So if, the, if this has a location, Then we're going to say hello from this location. Otherwise, we're going to say hello workshop participants. The last thing we're going to do is inside of this metadata, we're going to pass that city name as it. We can, if we want, we can give it a name. That's not necessary. That's okay. Save the file. Apologies. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so hello from Montreal. Always remember to save your files before executing your workflow. So we can also use this method um, uh, inside of a process. So we could pass this through Nextflow channels into a process. So we can have our custom class. Um, I'm gonna, just gonna call it meta. Great. So what we're going to do is we're going to echo meta.high. So we're going to have Nextflow resolve this call the high function on our meta object, which will return this hello from Montreal string, or perhaps hello from Montreal and hello from Boston. Um, and it's going to pipe that into T, which is going to echo it to standard output and also write it to this out.txt. We're going to add debug true so that we can see it happen uh, on the standard output. And here we run, next I run. Oops, we forgot to actually put it through here. I'm going to map it, create these new metadata objects and pass them into the use meta process. And you can see here we've written hello from Boston and hello from Montreal. If we want, we can view the output from that process, which will just be that out.txt, which defined as output here. And just to double check, you can see out.txt, hello from Montreal and hello from Boston. So why would you ever want to do this? Um, most of the time you'll get, you won't need to, but there'll be occasions where uh, it be can become very helpful. So for example, um, let's say you have some metadata class, um, some metadata inside of a, a map object, 
and you'd like to add some class, add some methods to that metadata object to, for example, pull out the prefix of an adapter. So let's say you have a metadata class that has an adapter key um, and you want the start of the adapter, you could add a method like this get adapter start, which just pulls out a substring, the first three characters of the adapter. Um, this is just a very simple example, but you can imagine adding extra methods to that metadata class to pull out specialized pieces of information or calculate special values. I'll show you what that looks like. So let's say in our metadata class, we, in addition to that high method, we also have this get adapter start. And it says if there's an adapter key inside of our map, then pull out the substring, the first three letters. So we're going to uh, create the new metadata and we're going to also um, add in this new adapter key. So now inside of the use meta process, we're pulling this metadata adapter and the key, which was just as normal. And we're also using this get adapter start uh, method. So now inside of out.txt, we should see the prefix is AAC, which is correct. And of course, as we described earlier in the workshop, these get methods can be shortened. Um, but in the context of a map, it's probably safer to uh, use the full method name. So at the moment we've just demonstrated, I've demonstrated using like simple methods to pull existing data, but you might want even to reach out to external services, perhaps to a limb system or to an API or to some sort of tooling inside of your own, uh, own infrastructure. Let's add this get sample name um, method to my uh, metadata.groovy object. Uh, and to do that, uh, I'm gonna need one extra piece of Groovy. I'm gonna import this JSON slope object just as we did earlier for the JSON parsing example, because in this get sample name method, I'm reaching out to an external URL here in this case, it's just a Postman echo. But you can imagine this might be any piece of infrastructure, an API or um, a sequencing machine or any, any external piece that's communicated via HTTP calls. And I'm reaching out to this URL, I'm opening a connection, I'm getting the response, I'm checking that the response is 200, that is the response is okay. And we pass the JSON, the response into a JSON object, or we pass the JSON object into a map. Uh, and then pull out the uh, args.sample name. So we're pulling out a piece of that response. This is a very simple little dumb example, but you can imagine doing um, arbitrarily complicated things inside of these get sample names. Obviously, it's important to keep this not go too overboard. Um, you don't want to be doing real computation inside of these things, uh, inside of these classes and inside of these methods, but it's sometimes very handy to have that ability. So now, if uh, I modify this process use meta to add this meta dot get sample name inside, so when Nextflow constructs the process, constructs the task, and writes the dot commando sh, it's actually going to call this get sample name on the meta object. And I can see here, it's it's reached out to the web, called the URL, and pulled out the uh, the response. Now there is a warning here, a caveat. Um, 
when we start to pull custom classes through Nextflow, um, we need to understand a little bit more about the caching mechanism. Uh, when each task is run, Nextflow calculates a unique hash based on the task's inputs. Um, so for example, if there's a file input or a path, by default, it'll take the path, the string of the path, the mass modified date, um, uh, pieces of metadata like that. Um, in the case of a value like a map, it'll take the, the hash of that map and then take each of those pieces and to calculate a hash for the task as a whole. But because we're adding methods to this class, that adding methods here is not going to change the hash of the value of the item being passed in, which can be dangerous because we might change the way get sample name works, but that's not going to change the um, the hash for the task. And so we're going to have caching, pull up cache results when perhaps we don't mean to. So for the next five minutes or so, I'm going to sh ask you if you can run through this exercise. Can you show how changing a method in the metadata class does not change the hash of the task? We'll be back in, in five minutes or so.
Okay, great. Welcome back. Um, here's one example of the solution. So let's say we run this with resume. Great, and I picked up cache results um, as expected. But let's say I change the behavior of one of these methods, for example, get adapter start. So instead of grabbing the first three bases, I want to grab the first five bases of the adapter. If I run Nextflow run resume, a naive approach might imagine that this is going to change the, the task cache because I will sort of anticipating this is going to change the script because this get adapter start method is called inside the script. But keep in mind that the inputs to the task are just the value itself. So it's just in this case, because I'm extending hash map, it's just the keys and values inside of the hash map, which is not changing only this accessory method. So even though I've changed that method, next level will should still pick up the cache tasks. Cache will only change and be recalculated if I change the values inside of that hash map, for example. So if I add, if I change the hash values, now next level will recalculate the hash. The hash will miss, and then it will use the new get adapter start method. But changing the methods in and of themselves do not change the hash. So in this example, I've shown you um, extending an existing method, existing class, this hash map class. But we could also, uh, if we want, um, create entirely new classes, for example. Let's create a dog.groovy, a dog class. Um, and this class is sort of like a records object that contains a string name and a Boolean value, it's hungry. Let's simplify our workflow. So let's create a new dog um, where whose name is Fido. And we're just going to log info, found a new dog, and then showing the dog. Oops. We run this. Fantastic. Found a new dog, and then it's returned the string representation of this dog object. We can pass objects um, through channels. So if we change our workflow to have a channel of dog names, and then we pass it through a map where the closure creates a new dog object with the name, and we view those outputs. We see our three new dogs, but at the moment, we need, we're missing something uh, before this can be used inside of a next flow task and caching to be used correctly. So for the next five minutes, I'm going to pause. If you could run this exercise and show that the dog class is not cached when resuming a workflow. We'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Let's make a process that uses one of these dogs to show that we, it's, the caching is not working. Dogs have a name property, which I can address like this. I can pass each of them to the pat dog process. And I have run it three times. Now, if I resume, not, not change anything. But note here that no caching has been used for these processes. To do so, we need to turn this dog into a value object. So Nextflow very helpfully has provided a decorator to serialize these custom classes um, by adding this value objects decoration. Um, it will use the sort of properties here, the name and the is hungry value uh, as the elements that are being hashed into the, um, uh, to provide the inputs to the task. The last thing we need to do is register the class with cryo, which is the serialization library. I'm gonna do that uh, inside of the main.nf. Ideally at the top, so I can just do it here. Um, importing the cryo helper and then cryo helper dot register dog. So now, um, last exercise for this particular chapter is I want you to show that the dog class. Now that we've done the work of adding this value object annotation and then registering our class with cryo helper that can be used inside of processes and the caching works correctly. See you in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Let's try now with this uh, this new cryo registered uh, dog class. So now, if we use this pass this dog to this pat dog process, first time registers the caches. And now if we rerun the same tasks, we have three cache tasks. So now that we've registered this dog, Nextflow knows how to cache this, or sort of calculate a hash for this dog object. So in this case, because we're using value object, it's going to take the name and the Boolean values of these classes here, the class values here, and use those as hash inputs. So that if they change, um, we should see two cache tasks and one uh, new task. Perfect. Great. So this is how you might introduce custom classes into your workflows uh, for small utilities um, uh, or reaching out to external services. From here, we're going to take a, a short break. Um, if you're watching this live, now is a great chance, if you haven't already, to drop by the SEP23 SEP advanced training channel on the NF Core Slack. Uh, myself and uh, other volunteers are hanging out there. If you have any questions, we'd love to help um, help out. Um, if you want to chat anything Nextflow or NFCore, um, we'd love to talk to you there. Um, of course, very welcome to uh, pop in questions all the way through the workshop. Um, but we'll see you there. Um, if not, we'll see you back here for more training in half an hour. See you soon.
This chapter, uh, we want to cover a little bit about NextFlow configuration. While it might not be the most glamorous um, of, of chapters, particularly to finish on, it is a particularly important um, piece of how NextFlow works and something that we think uh, some people can get wrong uh, quite easily. So we're going to talk about um, where configuration is set, order of precedence, and cover some uh, sort of intermediate configuration options about dynamic directives. Um, and uh, label selectors. Let's get into it. So let's talk config. Um, it's an aspect of NextFlow that can be a little confusing to some. There, because there are multiple ways of loading configuration. It's very flexible, uh, which is a great advantage, uh, but can be a little intimidating for some newcomers. Uh, it gives us a couple of complications, like particularly at which location should I be loading a configuration value and, and what sort of configuration can I change? Or what sort of values and what sort of behaviors in NextFlow can I change via configuration? The first thing that I think we need to cover is our precedence. But before that, let's make a new directory. Uh, I'm going to call it advanced configuration. Um, and let's talk about the order of precedence. What I like to, how I like to think about it is that the precedence is really roughly in order of distance from the command line invocation. So those parameters specified directly on the command line, like parameters with a double dash notation or configuration options with a single dash notation, um, uh, take the highest precedent. They're sort of, you're typing them on the command line, they're right there um, at the command line. The next the highest level of precedence are the parameter files or parameters that are supplied via the dash params dash file option. So these are again supplied by the command line, but rather than make directly on the command line, it's a file referred to by a command line option. Similarly, for the configuration, so the, the sort of twin, the cognate um, config option uh, is the dash C option. So params file for parameters and dash C for configuration. So parameters are those. Uh, parameters that are set by the workflow and the dash the config is, uh, configuration that affects NextFlow as a whole. The fourth level of precedence is the configuration file named nextflow.config in the current working directory. So these are not referred to by the command line. It's sort of implied. Uh, there's configuration values. When NextFlow run, it looks for a nextflow.config file in the current working directory and picks up configuration and parameters from that file. That's the fourth level of precedence. One level further away is the nextflow.config in the workflow project directory. So that might be a nextflow.config in GitHub somewhere, or GitLab, or Katia, or Bitbucket, or CodeCommit, or something like that. So it's a nextflow.config in the work the workflow project directory. So in the root of the workflow, or a configuration file that's imported by that file by include config. Almost second to last is the configuration file in home, so home.nextflow slash config. So these configuration values apply to all runs in a, for a given user, uh, but they're very low precedence. And lastly, the final configuration values are those specified by the workflow itself in main.nf or any of the .nf scripts inside of the workflow. So you, if you can think of it as stepping away from the command line, from right on the command line to a file referred to by the command line invocation to a file in the current working directory to a file on GitHub or a remote uh, server. Um, and then finally, parameters and configuration in main.nf on the workflow in the remote server. So why might you use uh, some of these configuration values? For example, system-wide configuration. Uh, these are really handy for setting configuration values that you know you want to have applied on every run on a given system. That is, for example, I might want to use Docker on every run on the system. Like even on this, uh, on this particular machine, um, I have Docker. I don't have tools installed. So if I run... Um, if I run the RNA-seq NF workflow, it's going to take a second to download the containers. Um, but I don't have any of the tools installed. So I will always, this will certainly fail uh, because I don't have, for example, FastQC installed or Fast, yeah, FastQC in this case. So I'm, I'll, my, or I'm always going to want to run inside of Docker. So I'm going to run docker.enable equals true into home.nextflow slash config. 
just to make sure it's there. Great. And now I can run exactly the same command. Next, we'll run RNA seq and F. And it's going to use the Docker containers. It's going to pull and use those Docker containers for the, each of these processes. And I didn't have to change anything on my command line invocation because those configuration options specified in home.nextflow.slash config will apply to all runs unless they're overridden by a configuration at a higher level of precedence. Another reason you might want to do this is, for example, you're on an HP system, HPC system that always has Slurm as the executor and perhaps always has uses singularity for their containers. Your home.nextflow slash config file might include lines like these. Processor executor is Slurm and singularity.enable equals true. Uh, the configuration values will be inherited by every run on that system. Um, so let's talk about overriding process directives. Um, process level directives like CPUs, memories, there's a whole list of them um, here in the next flow configuration. There's many, many configuration uh, process level directives. All of these can be overridden um, by, a config by a configuration. So let's give an example. Let's create a new nextflow.config in the current working directory. And we're going to say process CPUs equals two. So I would like to make sure that every single process, every single task that I run in this working directory uh, uses two CPUs. So I can run that same nextflow run RNA seq and F, the same workflow. And it's going to ensure that each task is supplied with two CPUs. And that's going to be for all of the tasks, unless otherwise overridden. We can make these configuration values more specific by using process selectors. So we can select on the name and or any labels that have been uh, defined by the workflow authors. So I'm going to run, again, a process block. And this is in nextflow.config using the with name selector. I'm going to make sure that any processes or any tasks that match the process name RNA seq colon index, that is this task here, are run with two CPUs. All other tasks are left um, with the default. I can override the default with CPUs one. So this says, this ensures that by default, all, C, all tasks get one CPU unless they match this with name selector, in which case they get two CPUs. And if we have lots of tasks, we might also be interested in using uh, glob pattern matching. So instead of RAC colon index, we could do dot star uh, colon index to match any tasks with the process name that ends with index. Just to make sure this is working, um, it may be helpful to set the tag, which is the tag is the value that's, that's printed out in parentheses here. Of course, I could log into the uh, CD into the work directories and double check the CPU allocations, um, but sometimes it's quite handy just to set the tag. And I can see here the tag for the RNA seq index has been set, um, but the others have been have remained um, as the default. So this is interesting, um, but the really interesting and the really powerful work comes in dynamic directives. So you can specify dynamic directives using closures, uh, same sort of closures that we've been talking about for the whole workshop. Um, and those closures are evaluated as the task is submitted. This plays into this, one of the strengths of Nextflow, that it is a data flow oriented uh, sort of paradigm in that task execution is calculated at, or like there can be, uh, they can rather, there can be uh, elements of the task that are calculated as the task is executed rather than before when the run is run begins. So you Nextflow can be very dynamic uh, and calculate 
directives, as an example, at task execution time or task submission time. So let's say we want to run the RNA seq NF workflow the run we've been the, the run we've been uh, demoing here. That includes a fastqc process that looks like this. So it's the process fastqc and it has some inputs, the sample ID and path reads. And I can already see here that we're dynamically evaluating the tag. This sample ID is being used in the tag directive here with dollar sign sample ID. We can override that tag. And if we're using setting values inside of the process like a .nf script, we don't need the equal sign, but it's really important to note that uh, if you're setting uh, values inside of configuration, the equal sign is needed. The other thing to note is that if we're using dynamic directives, we're going to need to supply a closure here. So we're saying, I'm going to defer evaluation of this. I'm just going to supply a closure that's going to be evaluated later rather than evaluated when the configuration file is passed. So I'm just going to change the wording here to found a sample. Right, fast QC, found a sample, gcalga. So in, in addition to the sample ID value, we also have access to the reads value. So we might want to dynamically scale, for example, the number of CPUs on a task, depending on how many reads were supplied. Again, because we're going to use a dynamic directive, we're going to put it inside of a closure. I'm going to say the CPUs is value equal to reads.size. So if there is only one read supplied, then the task gets one CPU. Um, and if there are two reads supplied, then the task will get two CPUs. Just to make sure, just so you uh, sure that I'm uh, actually doing this. We can set a tag to pull that reads.size, uh, evaluate that at uh, submission time as well. Perfect. An even more advanced uh, option that I haven't seen a lot of, but I suspect we might start to see some is scaling the uh, resources like CPUs or like memory based on the input file size, not just the Size, this size here is calculating the size of the collection. So how big is the list of files? But we can also calculate the size of the actual files themselves in bytes. So um, here, let's make this tag directive a little bit more complicated. So the total bytes, we can do arbitrary computation here. The total bytes is the reads, and we're going to use the spread notation that we introduced earlier. So I'm going to iterate over every element in this reads collection and calculate the size, which is going to return the number of bytes. And we're going to echo that out here, or rather we're going to change the tag to say the total input size is... And we're going to use as memory unit. And a memory unit is a Nextflow built-in class for turning strings and integers into human-readable memory units. Oops. And we need to actually sum those, sum those together. So when we are... Uh, take the reads collection, we calculate the size on each of them, that, that leaves us with a collection of uh, integer sizes, and then we call sum to sum them together. Perfect. You can see here the total input size is 1.3 megs. So you could use, just as we're setting tag here, you could use the same sort of idea 
to calculate the total input size of a given process and use that to scale, for example, the memory or the CPUs of that task or process. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to use that for all tasks uh, as a blanket statement, but if you know particular programs or particular steps in your workflow scale or the memory required scales with the input size, um, then this might be a helpful way to dynamically calculate uh, the, the amount of memory uh, that is required by a particular task. And lastly, the most common sort of dynamic directive is used for retry strategies. Nextflow gives you the option of if upon task failure, resubmitting that task um, again. You might want to resubmit it again because it's a flaky program that um, or requires network IO, or you would just like to give it another go. But you could also dynamically uh, evaluate things like CPUs and memory so that on resubmission, the task is allocated more memory or more CPUs. To do this, two directives are needed, the max retries and the error strategy directive. The error strategy directive determines what action Nextflow should take given a task failure. That is, if the .execode file does not contain a zero. Um, so the options are either you can terminate this, uh, the run completely, and this is the default. So upon any task failure, Nextflow stops everything. It cancels in-progress tasks and winds everything back and cancels and sort of finishes and exits as quickly as possible. The second option is finish. This is a little bit more elegant in that Nextflow will allow processes and tasks that have begun to finish on their own steam and then tidy everything up, but it's not gonna, re not gonna submit any new tasks. The ignore retry strategy, or try the ignore error strategy simply ignores any errors from that task um, on that process. And it simply won't output anything into the output channel. This can be a little bit dangerous, but there are times when it's helpful. And the retry error strategy is the one that will allow Nextflow to resubmit the task. Um, and it will resubmit the task up to a value specified by max entries. So if we're using a closure um, to specify a dynamic directive, we also have access in addition to the variables defined like reads, and to, uh, like the ones here, like sample ID and reads, we also have access to a special variable called task. And this task variable has um, an, a dot attempt uh, property. And that dot attempt property is incremented every time the task is retried. So this allows us to work out for any given run, what is the number of task attempts? So here, we can imagine setting the process configuration like so. So here we're going to say, for all processes with name RNA quant, we're going to retry on any failure. We're going to retry up to three times, and the memory taken by this uh, task, that or given to the task, will be defined by the this closure. So on the first attempt, um, Nextflow will attempt to run the task with two gigs of RAM um, and one hour of wall time. On resubmission, it's going to take four gigs of RAM and two hours of wall time. And finally, it's going to try with six gigs of RAM and three hours of wall time. Um, as before, uh, I mentioned before, when using config thing configuration via, via this nextflow.config, well, you will always require an equal sign. Um, and as opposed to specifying configuration and process directives inside of an NF file, where the equal sign is no, not required. I hope this has been helpful and I uh, look forward to seeing some interesting configuration values uh, popping up in the NF Core community soon. With that, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for uh, Q&A. We have a lot of people who have registered for this and I expect there'll be uh, lots of questions. And just so we get them all in, um, we're going to pause here for to open up the the floor on Slack. So don't forget to log into the SEP23 advanced training channel on the NF Core Slack. Um, ask your questions there. I want to thank you uh, for coming and listening to the uh, first community uh, advanced Nextflow training. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback and we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Uh, thanks very much. I'll see you soon.